Welcome. Uh, my name is Joe Flessa, and I'm an associate professor in. Oh, I'm not going to get the department name right, so I'll just tell you what program I'm in. I teach in uh, educational administration. I'm a professor of policy and politics there. Um, I'm also the acting director for the Center for Urban Schooling, while our colleague uh, Lance McCready, the professor of urban education, is on leave. And here at the Center for Urban Schooling, we have a dual mandate. We have a mandate, uh, we have a responsibility to serve as a bridge between the university and the public schools in our urban communities. And we have the responsibility to try to build and mobilize the best Canadian research on urban education in Canada. And tonight's panel is a terrific example of the potential inherent in constructing that bridge. Um, we have several distinguished panelists, so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves rather than me take up time. I'm the least important person at the front of the room by far. Um, and they're going to share research that helps us understand education and diversity in a cross-Canadian context, and hopefully we'll have time for questions that respond to their explanation of, of, uh, of their understanding for Montreal, how to understand schooling and diversity. Um, I want to say a couple of thank yous before we start. Um, first, thank you for the panelists who made the journey. Uh, thank you for audience members who are here also. I also want to thank the uh, Office of the Associate Dean for Research here at OISE who has provided some funding through the OISE Visiting Scholars Program. And I'm going to use the fact that I'm um, uh, standing up and talking to announce two other Center for Urban Schooling events. One is on Thursday, November 27th, we'll be hosting an event called Educational Activism in Increasingly Conservative Times with an exciting local uh, set of panelists and a visiting uh, panelist coming from Chicago to talk about the recent uh, teachers mobilization there. And I wanted to announce that there's uh, four scholarships in urban education that are being provided for the next uh, cycle of admissions uh, through the Center for Urban Schooling, through the William Waters Scholarships. If you know people who may be interested in these scholarships, they're fantastic. They're, uh, each one is worth $30,000. So um, please, uh, at the end of the event, uh, take some of these flyers. So, um, without further ado, the, the format for this will be each of, the, each of our, our panelists will have about 15 minutes. My job is to be the annoying heavy who says like, okay, 15 minutes is up, we need to move to the next person, and then when we conclude, uh, there'll be some time for audience question and answer. Okay, make sense? Yes. Are we all in agreement? Yes. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so much for uh, the Center for Urban Schooling for inviting us. It's really a pleasure. Just to uh, tell you, I have only five minutes. You only have five? Yeah, because the other oh. will have 15 minutes. Oh, that's right. Just before you start, there's three chairs there, in, so people could take them before and actually start. Come in, come in. So what I will be doing is really uh, an introduction to the Montreal context, so, so it's really descriptive. Uh, it will give you a brief overview of the Montreal context before you hear the three conferences. So very descriptive. Uh, we'll present descriptive statistics on education and diversity in Montreal, so you can have an overview. And a timeline of major events pertaining to immigration and diversity in schools. So really a selection of major events, because there are a lot of events major in Quebec. So here you can see the proportion of preschool, primary, and high school attendees from immigrant backgrounds in the Montreal region. Um, so what you can see is the high percentage of first and second generation in, in the French sector as compared to the English sector. Uh, the French school system in Montreal is more multi-ethnic than in the English school system. Over 90% of students of immigrants origin now attend French language schools in Quebec. So they mainly go to French schools. And I must see that approximately one third of Montreal schools includes a majority of students uh, who are from immigrant backgrounds. And some schools have may, maybe 80, 90 percent of students from immigrant backgrounds. So the second table is the proportion of preschool, primary, and high school attendees in the Montreal region by modern times. Uh, so you can see a high proportion of households in, in both French sectors. Uh, particularly in public schools where they represent 47 percent. So you can see that other languages are highly represented in uh, French school. 
as compared to English schools. Another table shows the proportion of preschool, primary, and high school attendees from immigrant backgrounds by continents of origins. So you can see uh, from Asia the percentages, Africa, Americas, Europe, and Australia, Oceania. Uh, we, it's worth mentioning that when we talk about Asia, there is a high concentration of attendees from South East Asia and from the Middle East, except uh, especially in the uh, private sector. Uh, when we talk about Africa, we have a high concentration of attendees from North Africa. Uh, and for the Americas, we have a high concentration of attendees from the Antillas and Bermuda. And in Europe, we have a high concentration of attendees from Eastern Europe and in, in, in French private school from Western Europe. So here, you can have a brief overview of the continents of origin. If we look really quickly at, at the, this timeline through selection, uh, we must remember 1977, Bill 101 was adopted in Quebec, uh, requiring newcomers to attend French language schools. So this changed the, the, the concentration in the schools. Um, 1985, a Quebec report introduces the term intercultural education for the first time. Uh, in 1995, there is intercultural awareness enters into formal criteria for teacher education programs in university. And it's really in 1998 that the policy introduced the diversification in reception services to immigrants. Uh, providing guidelines for reasonable accommodation, accommodement raisonnable, and bringing intercultural education to all regions of Quebec. So, what do we mean by intercultural education? Uh, really simply, learning how to live together in a democratic, pluralist, and French-speaking society. Uh, so it's a model that is between uh, Canadian multiculturalism and French Jacobinism. So the ideal embraced in Quebec is really the recognition of pluralism and equality of individuals, but living in a French-speaking society. So this is mainly what the Quebec government means by intercultural education. Mm. And we must summarize it by three main goals. Um, integrating people of various ethnocultural origins at all levels of employment in the education system, providing training and professional development of teaching staff, mm -hmm. and implementing a pluralist transformation of the formal and real curriculum. So we must say that in the policy there is a tension between common values and the recognition of diversity. Uh, this policy has not been questioned nor updated since 1998. It still forms the basis of the Ministry of Education initiatives. Uh, the majority of actions that have been achieved go along these three goals. Um, however, it is still a work in progress. Uh, progress has been limited to the applied policy to milieus that do not experience diversity daily. And progress, we must say, uh, is limited as to openness to linguistic diversity by the fragile majority of Quebec, francophone majority, um, and difficulties also to put emphasis on uh, the immigrants' language of origin uh, in the schools and to accept diversity, linguistic diversity. So this was really a short overview, so it sets the floor for the three other conferences. Yes, when you're ready. Terrific. Okay. So I'm actually, it's going to be a quantitative data presentation without quantitative data. So you're going to like it <laughs> if you're not uh, in. So basically, it, it follows well with what Mar Marie Odile was saying. By the way, I'm Marie McAndrew, and my postdoctoral student, Alassane Balde, is here. We're both from the, 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 the chair, Canada Researcher on Education and Ethnic Relations. Uh, basically, uh, one of the of the, the, of the lesser aspects of the policy statement was clearly the equality of access and outcomes for immigrant students. When the policy was written in 1998, there was a feeling that immigrant students were doing as well or even better than third generation plus students. So it was, uh, it was not very much stress in the policy. 
But what happened over the years, I'm sorry, is that uh, actually uh, more and more data got more sophisticated and people developed a need, a sense of awareness that we needed specific studies on the school trajectory of immigrant origin students, that we needed our data. Uh, and there's been a lot of partnership between the researcher, the Department of Education, school boards, and, and even community groups, such as the, the Black Educators of Quebec, to use those administrative data banks to do some assessment. Uh, in Quebec, we have very good data banks. Um, uh, collected at the Quebec level, uh, at the Quebec level, so we can do a lot of things to do assessment, but those were not used very much. Uh, after, for 10 years, there were small the, to those specific studies. In 2010, uh, a research team of nine researchers and three uh, government partners got established F3RSC is jargon, it's a Quebec funding program, so we put researchers together and uh, they, they work and you know, do network and transmit more their, their data to the community. And uh, the aim of the program is to, first of all, it has quantitative and qualitative researcher. Aim of the program is to contrast the quantitative and qualitative approach. Quantitative data usually tends to say that things are not so bad. Qualitative research is often in ad with ASRI students, so the discourse is much more negative. So how do you reconcile qualitative and quantitative data to make an assessment about school success of immigrant students? We want to synthesize the main conclusion, and obviously we also want to uh, open a conversation with the community at risk. <laughs> now I'll do something very unacademic. I will skip most of the methodology. What I'm presenting to you today is 18 quantitative studies. And now I'm, 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 aware, I'm we are working on the qualitative side, but what is finished is the quantitative study. But, but I'll skip all this. I'll give you the PowerPoint if you want. So basically, there's 18 studies. They, mo they all use the administrative data banks. 14 are using the same core. They're all on high school. Uh, high school trajectories, uh, students who enter high school from 98 to 2000. They include uh, uh, descriptive and regression analysis, some of them, the portraits by communities, and specific uh, uh, analysis, Montreal versus region, first versus second generations, uh, people of the adult education sector, so on and so forth. Uh, they have many, many indicators that you will see when I present the data. Uh, so I skip that. And there's four other studies, one of which is of some of interest for you, which is one we did with a comparison with Ontario and BC, uh, actually Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, it's called the MTV project, maybe some of you are from TDSB and you're Rob Brown, good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that because in that case, because uh, Vancouver uh, don't have data on immigrant status, we had to use language. So it was francophone versus non-francophone or anglophone versus non-anglophone. While all the other studies, we use first, second generation plus country of origin. So if you hear me sometimes speak about immigrant origin and other times francophone, it's just because I'm referring to a different study. So basically, we have those 18 studies. If you want more details, ask me questions. You have the list at the end. What are the main results? about the portrait, uh, I'll focus on the French sector, we have data also of an English sector, but 15 minutes is 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> characteristic of, as I said, you, characteristic of immigrant origin students in high school uh, in all over Quebec. Six, six out of them were born abroad, so it means that we have a good percentage of second generation, and very interesting, half of the students of first and second generation as, as French, as mother tongue or uh, mm -hmm. uh, tongue, uh, mother, uh, excuse me, language use at home. So that basically means that either because Quebec selected immigrants who already knew French or because second generation students are adopting French, actually uh, half of the immigrant origin population uh, uses French very regularly. That's totally contrary to the, the linguistic debate in Quebec, but apparently, um, <laughs> You know, it's not because no knowledge exists that it can be shared. Uh, uh, the immigrant origin students have a similar proportion of boys and girls, which is important for school success, as we all know, girls are doing better than boys. So if a community was over representative with boys, they would have lower indicators. Uh, they live much more often in Montreal than the third generation plus students. They are very concentrated, more than your immigrants are concentrated in Ontario, uh, in Toronto compared to the rest of Ontario. Mon Quebec is very, very concentrated uh, immigration in Montreal. They are more often from socioeconomically challenged families. 
if you ask me how do we define it, you'll ask me, uh, the, because we can, we can take five minutes, but it is government indicators that like you have in Ontario about challenge schools, so we have indicators. And uh, uh, actually, one student, um, they entered less often, they enter more often the school system after primary school. One student out of four enter during high school. It still shows that three quarter of the students had primary schooling in Quebec. So if they have problem, you cannot say it's because you know their, their schooling was bad in their country of origin. But still, 25% enter uh, at the secondary level. This is high. Uh, they obviously they had more often delay when they enter high school. One year uh, for one student out of three, and two years and more was one student out of ten. Uh, as expected, they needed more often support in high school, uh, linguistic support. Interesting data, different from Ontario, I guess. They were identified as accurate students in a similar proportion. In Quebec, first, uh, overall, one, one student out of five is identified with receiving some type of service, and it doesn't differ with where people are first, second, third generation plus. There will be some difference among ethnic groups, but now I'm covering the generalities. Uh, they tend to change less often school. Also, that's a difference with Ontario too, because I've seen data where your students are moving more. But the, the, stu the immigrant students stay more the same place in Quebec than third generation students. Uh, they choose more often private school. And when, if you wonder why, Mario just forgot to say that Quebec government, at least until now, subsidized private school. For those who wouldn't know, so it means going to private school costs you two or three thousand dollars a year. It doesn't cost you twenty thousand dollars like in Ontario. So basically, it means that it, it's a middle class plus phenomenon. Also, they are highly concentrated in Montreal. So as immigrants are concentrated in Montreal, immigrants are more so often choosing public school than the overall of Quebec. So it also shows us that immigrants are also well distributed in different uh, social category. But when they attend the public school. They are more often in those socioeconomically challenged schools uh, than in well-off schools. So it would show that you probably have a bipolarization of immigrants. Mm -hmm. Part of them going more to private school, and other part when they go to public school, ending up in those at-risk schools, uh, which are, uh, in our jargon, is uh, decile 8, 9, and 10, but it resembles what you have in them. And they are more often school in a high ethnic concentration school, which is normal. Okay. Uh, now, when you, I will never have time. When, if you limit oneself to two, the 12 risk factor, you can say that overall the profile of immigrant student origin is more negative in eight instances, similar in two instances, gender and identification as actress student, and more positive in two instances. And overall, profile of third generation student is more negative, while second and third generation don't have a lot of, have, have the, hardly no difference. So although we tend to look at first, second generation together, <coughs> first generation is one story, second, third, and third plus, uh, look, will it look? But now I'm skipping, oh, one thing. Last thing, I, I told you already, region of origin does matter. So you can see, for example, that South Asian students have I, 11 negative risk factor, only one positive, while if you take the North Africa and Middle East students, they are more in between. Uh, Central South America. So you can see the pecking order of socioeconomic and uh, schooling characteristic at the entrance. And the regional differences, uh, Montreal students are, are, are have a less positive profile than suburbs, but the worst of all are the, 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 the few immigrants attending outlying region in mm -hmm. Quebec, which have a very, because traditionally the government tended to send refugee there. That's one of the explanations, there may be other. Okay. Okay, school performance now. Uh, when you compare third generation plus, or in the study we use francophone students, immigrant origin students, they uh, accumulated the same delay two years after entry into high school. They, but they did opt, obtain much less often a secondary school diploma five years after entry. There was a, a 11 point of percentage less. Even when you give them two more, I, remember, I, I recall you that the high school in Quebec is five years. Yes. Just to, because I know it's difficult to understand another system. So normally they should graduate after five years. They have 11 point of, of, the, of, um, of the deficit. Uh, seven years after entry, they still have eight point of percentage of deficit. Uh, but this is largely due to the fact that we don't control for students staying longer in adult education. 
and we don't control for student, student leaving the province because our data don't permit that. When we take those phenomena in, into account, what we call net dropout rate nine years after entry, then the, the mean of immigrant <coughs> origin students and, uh, and third generation plus is the same. When you're looking at performance, uh, they, uh, they ha when they survive up to secondaire 5, which is like your 12 or 13 grade, they have similar results at ministerial exam, slightly more positive in maths than in French, and, but they also chose more often the more selective math course. We don't have stream in Quebec, but only after the last year we can choose a difficult, a middle uh, or, or easy math. That's the only stream we have compared to Ontario, where your streaming is much more pronounced and early. But still, you can say that immigrant students are investing, or their families are investing towards the more selective one. But, but it doesn't mean that this, this is rosy, because actually, sorry, it doesn't move. Yes, okay. okay. What is important is that this is true for the full immigrant population. When you're looking at first generation students, their profile is much more negative. Uh, on all the account, uh, except choosing a more selective course in maths and the results in maths, but this is highly influenced by the presence of the Chinese. I'm sorry to make stereotype, but in this case, it's confirmed by data. Chinese students over, 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 over choose the difficult math students, and there are a lot of first generation, so it does, it does influence the data. Mm -hmm. What is important also is that the intergroup differences are very important. And they show a rather systematic picking orders on the six indicators, uh, with the Central and South American student being negative on m most of the indicators, well, whether you're speaking about graduation, delay, uh, net dropout, uh, average uh, rate in math and French. Then Caribbean and South Saharan Africa are second. Actually, they're pretty much the same, sorry. Then South Asia, Southeast Asia, and when you get to East Asia, as you can say, they overperform uh, on all the uh, indicators. The inter, and nevertheless, intra-group, these are gross region of origin. Huh? You, you, you admit like Asia is half of the, the, the country, South Asia is one third of the humanity. So it's very gross region of origin. When you look at, you know, when you disentangle different data, you can see that actually those regions are not homogeneous. El Hassan wants me to tell you that there's a big difference, for example, between Caribbean and South Saharan African. Mm -hmm. uh, South Saharan African has a more, have a more pro positive economic profile, mm -hmm. and given to that, they, are, they also have much, much better indicators of coastal mm -hmm. But that would be true in many of those gross regions, because it's always dangerous to take, you know, as I said, one third of the humanity under Southeast, Southeast Asia. And okay, I'm going to leave me. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Basically, what is important is that immigrant origin went in school again in outlying region. They are the lowest one, followed by Montreal, followed by suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to say a word, I'm sorry, about the factors. We tested, I mean, not we, but some four of the, uh, of the 18 studies tested factors that influence uh, this graduation. And what is interesting is that all the factors you've seen, they explain around 50% of graduation which is an extremely good news for people who are doing work in schools. It, say, it, it shows that even at high school, 50% is not explained by those socioeconomic or schooling process. It, it has to be explained it's the, either by family or by school, uh, school uh, practices. So that's a good news that the model doesn't explain everything. Then we would close school and just wait. So good, good news, half of the graduation is not explained by all these 12 race factors. Uh, nevertheless, I can look at them. Nine have a clear negative impact uh, that is concordant through different studies. Being identified as an actress student, uh, having accumulated additional delay two years after entering high school, entering high school with some delay, but the, the, this one is more important. So actually the first two years of high school uh, are more important in explaining graduation than the delay you may have when you enter in high school originating from Caribbean or, or Central and South America, being a boy, changing off in school, mm -hmm. attending a public school, 
uh, we find a positive effect of, of, of school board in Montreal, and I don't know if you'd be glad to know that even when controlled, because this is regression analysis, attending CSDM or CSMB is positively um, linked to a graduation. And I'm not expecting any money from the school board. <laughs> and we still mangle, we're trying to understand why this is the case, why that being attending some school board. And interesting thing, because I know you're interested about, um, about the difference that school make, is that uh, we have a variance between school around 20% that is not, in, in many studies, 21, 19, 18, which is not explained by the difference in the composition of their students. So I mean, even when you control the fact that they have that number of students, uh, different characteristics, poor, rich, uh, different origin, uh, different first generation, <coughs> after controlling, you still have a variance of 20%, so it means that school does matter. Uh, and I think it's a good news. Uh, now, the other one, they are complex to understand. Uh, interesting thing though, uh, socioeconomic status of family, having French as mother tongue, uh, degree of challenge of the school, ethnic concentration, these are all factors that go in all directions. They, they don't have a clear explanatory power. Uh, they're not. So I'm finishing. <laughs> okay. Uh, we think that from quantitative data, they have some issue we need to understand better with qualitative data. The main one I'd say is that we have to understand why there is so much intergroup difference among uh, immigrant origin students in obtaining a high school diploma. And is, the, is it mostly, you know, as the deficit theory goes, family uh, characteristic, or is it systemic practices? I think quantitative data points to the fact that there is probably both, but certainly systemic uh, is there. Uh, second thing we have also to understand uh, what how, I'll skip this one because <laughs> the, second one important what are the characteristics of and the strategies of school board and schools who make a difference. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, uh, yeah. last one because I'm skipping some of them. Uh, I know Francoise will be a good introduction for you. We have to understand better the relationship between mastering the the, the, the school language and your language of origin and school success. Because actually what we see is that not having French as your mother tongue or language at use does not explain graduation. So we need what we need to understand is how do students master those languages, not so much what they declare at the census, I speak this and that at home. And so I'll finish with this. You have the list of the 18 studies if you're interested. And I'd be glad to send the PowerPoint to anybody uh, interested. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. I think if there's. Anybody wants to sit on the floor in the front, please be welcome. So, anybody going to come? Me too. So it's a completely different story. It's a story of a partnership between a school board and university. Uh, we are going to present the two. Jacques Ledan from uh, Marguerite Bourgeois School Board, Françoise Armand, Université de Montréal. And as you may already notice, English is not my first language. And you have to guess the origin of my accent. I offer a coffee and uh, after that. <laughs> So, we are going to talk about in inclusive multilingual practice and professional development. So, the, we're going to have a three-part uh, presentation. The first part, I will present my school board. The second part, uh, Francois will present, we we'll call that Chartier 7, which is mainly a project that we have together, the university and the school board. And we will finish by the topic of teaching in a multi-ethnic milieu the principle of action. Mainly, uh, the funny thing about Quebec is that when you travel, you can take the plane six hours, and when you arrive at five o'clock, you see there's a little island called Montreal, and everybody's there, mainly. And I'm, I'm teaching here, I'm, I'm uh, managing here the West Island of uh, Montreal, which is a very big school board with 60, uh, school of primary, 15 of secondary, adult education, etc. So, Michel, mm -hmm. 
what we are concerned about a few years ago, if you say there were those data, is that when you see the mother tongue French, mother tongue, whoop, 43.1 in 2010, 209, 210, and it's decreasing. It's about 40 at the moment. So you can see that the student or the West Island of Montreal who has French as a mother tongue is getting low because a lot of immigration is coming into the West Island, the Middle Island, and in the East, it's still the French people who are there because there's referendary behind between them and the immigration is not going to the East. It has a tendency to come to the Middle and, but they have some in the East. So we were concerned about that. And also, the proportion of students who uh, went to a class, uh, we call that uh, uh, welcome, welcome, class. welcome class, you can see it's increasing. And even at the moment, you can see we have a lot of students, more and more students who are coming. What we have to understand is when the kids arrive in the uh, airport, they come to register to a school. We have so many that we have a, a kind of a, uh, what's it, a model that they, they are in the in a classroom where they are among themselves for one, two years, mainly. Okay. If you see this year, we have 2,212 2, students that are in those classrooms. So we have a lot of students that are in that classroom. And we have, the, at September, that was the last September, 1,425 who quit that classroom to be integrated into the regular classroom. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a lot of students. And when you, as you can see, that was the data of September, 39 French at home, Arabic, English, Spanish, Chinese, Russia, Roman, Tamil, and other. So as you can see, our French students are getting less, mother tongue. And mainly what you have to understand also is that the staff, the, the teacher, are mainly if they are there for the last, because it changed very quickly. Like in my neighborhood, a few, 10 years ago, we were mainly French, mother tongue, and now we are less, we are maybe like 20%. What I'm trying to say is that the staff still teach as if they have French mm -hmm. learning a first language in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have, we try to, and that's why the Shanti is there, we try to see with them what can be in, uh, improved? So in our strategic plan of the school board, we have main orientation is to live together in French, and we want to raise a proportion of students and adults that are uh, developed and uh, yeah. master the reading in French and the writing in French. We want also to uh, get things better in the services for the integration of those kids who just arrived in Montreal. And we want also to develop an approach, inter intercultural, intercultural approach. Uh, and we're going to work with Maggie soon in that uh, area. And uh, what we want to add to the, the, the main, one of our objectives is to add in our soutien uh, linguistic for those. Uh, we want also what that means that we want to talk to the French teacher and see who are receiving these students, what we can do or improve in our teaching strategy. What we know about the way the teachers are taking into account the diversity they have in their classroom. In fact, many teachers in regular classroom, class, classes, classrooms? Classrooms say that they are not trained to work with allophone students who are learners of the second language. A large number of teachers, principal, and school board respondents stress the need to raise awareness among teachers of regular classes, classrooms about the needs that the students have. Mm -hmm. We are um, working with teachers. We need metaphors. Mm -hmm. So this kind of image uh, are very helpful. Do you still? Uh, think that you can teach French in your classroom as a mother tongue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still another metaphor. Well, I'm working with teacher, and we are working together to, to, to build a new way of uh, doing our job in this <coughs> very, very multi-ethnic and plurilingual classrooms. Mm -hmm. In the same time, in Quebec, it's not really a good metaphor to, no. to speak about construction. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot <laughs> in. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure about this one. Um, it might be uh, <laughs> We're gonna go to a nice restaurant tonight. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> we are very active in our way. We are doing chantiers. Chantiers meaning construction. Yeah. So working with a teacher, it's a program uh, we are, which is funded by the Ministry of Education, support program to train the teachers. The title of the project is training primary school teachers to engage with the multi-ethnic, multilingual milieu to promote the development development of oral skills and literacy among allophone pupils. So it's a collaboration. It's a very important point between the Margaret Bourgeois School Board and the University of Montreal Department of Didactics and with all the eight pedagogical advisors of uh, the school board with the support of the Educational Resource Department. Just to see if you can understand because I, I had like 12 counselors okay, that, that are going to help the teacher. And they told me like uh, three years ago, he said, I don't know the strategy to, uh, for the learning a second language. I said, we have a problem because we have students. So that's why I say, and the project, what was interesting, I said, okay, we're going to train the counselor, which you don't like to be trained as the, at, at the same time as the teacher. Mm -hmm. But I said, no, it's going to be good because both we can learn and we can have a resources from the university coming and help us. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, because I say, if you stay in the first language, you're going to lose your job. <laughs> I will go and pick some people who are more... Uh, Incident language. <laughs> <laughs> nice it's pressure. a good way to, to, to have motivation <laughs> for <laughs> with your pedagogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> nice pressure. Also, it's a, it's a chantier set with um, different partners, and it's very important in this kind of pro project. We have the collaboration of uh, a Montreal School for All, which is a ministry organization we, we, which intervenes in um, inner, city school. inner city school. We have also different people from Montreal's libraries, and we have also the participation of, uh, from the mayor's Direction de Services Communautés Culturelles. How do we do? meeting every month with a team of French pedagogical advisors. We, sh we develop a shared vision. We are sharing and we are having a reflection on the foundations of inclusive education. So during two years, we have meetings every month. Uh, at the same time, during the two years of the project, we have monthly training meetings with 25 volunteers, teachers from four schools. We are testing the pedagogical proposal with the support of the pedagogical advisors in school back to the, to the, to the test, critical thinking. So we are uh, looking at the training model. And the last point is very important. We ask to this team of pedagogical advisors and volunteer teachers to share inside the schools what they have done. And this moment that you, they, are, they are becoming themselves disseminators is very, very important to digere. Mm -hmm. Digest. 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 Digest and give it again. And the main important point is, is that, as you can see, the time. Because I said to my yes. director general, it's not something that you can do in a month. Mm -hmm. Say how long? I said two years. Two years. Because now we are only with 25 teachers, but at the end of this, uh, this year, we want to develop a model, and after that, the, the counselor will be trained. And now, after that, we can uh, reach more teachers. But I said, we'll take two years, and he said, okay. Mm -hmm. We well, had the money with the government, so that was a good... Uh... A few words about the principles of this Chantier set is seeking balance. Teachers involved in the multi-ethnic and multilingual milieu are required to develop high-level skills, enabling them to focus on the learning of the second language, language of instruction, French, and at the same time take into account the linguistic and cultural baggage of the pupils. Another metaphor, very important, and you are going to learn a new word in French. You are, I told the teachers that uh, to be funambule, men on wire, huh? men on wire, funambule. I told them, you have a magnificent view when you are there. It's a little dangerous, but you have a wonderful life. You are very high, high, high level skills when you are there. Because what, what does he say, this uh, man, Philippe Petit? I have no reason to uh, to be scared to fall. I cannot fall. Mm -hmm. From the from the, that point, uh, I have the, some reserve that I, of energy that I even didn't know. On the cable, I'm, I have the feeling I am indestructible, unless I will not go there. It's mm -hmm. the spirit he attract the the, the the body, not the, the reverse. Not the reverse. No, 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 the reverse. 
good metaphor for, for teachers who, are, who want to develop their professional identity. This man doesn't, he has no feeling, no, nothing. They know, they are not like that no net. a few months ago. No net, he has no, no net. net. Because they say, you never seen a bird with some, uh, no, they can lesson. Yeah, with a leech. With a leech. And the most important is where I, I can catch the, the teachers. So I'm applying to uh, build to net. Uh, the, so, it's hard to uh, explain this. A net of certitude, a net of knowledge. Under my. A net of certitude. No, so you can see the metaphor. You can do everything if you have a background of. Uh, I can justify. I can justify what I what I'm doing here. Yeah, well, explain. So what do we do? What kind of interventions do we propose to the teachers? Many specific and concrete interventions have been implemented in different classes in Quebec and elsewhere in the world to illustrate this approach. Well, for example, story in the bag. I'm going to tell a few words about this. Uh, language awareness approach. Employing books that evoke other languages and cultures, difference, otherness. Using bilingual or multilingual books. Production of bilingual and multilingual identity texts, of course, James is here. And also to be to develop a complicity in the classroom, to have what's gonna appell the multilingual clender in the classroom, winks. All the time you are aware and active about taking into account the different language present in the classroom. A few words a very few words <laughs> <laughs> about the story in the bag. Uh, the story in the bag it's a project successfully implemented in more than 100 Montreal schools. The main objective is to bring the school and family together to support and encourage family literacy activities in French while prompting the mother tongue. How does it work? For a period of three to four days, students in the target classes bring home a bag that contains a bilingual children's book, a CD of the book in several languages, uh, I'm 12 or 13 languages a CD, a game related to the book for the whole family to play together. And the, the game was developed by, by parents working with teachers. So it's really collaboration between schools, family, around multilingual practices, literacy practices. So working together, reading together, and I have different uh, témoignages, but I will. Mm -hmm. Another intervention is language awareness. It's through the manipulation and contact with different languages that learners become aware of the diversity among languages and the people to speak them, to speak, who speak them. So we have several activities around this. We are talking about the different, uh, the different uh, ways the animal does, uh, or does, Comment un elephant barre-t-il en japonais? What does an elephant do in Japanese? In Japanese. Uh, you know that uh, in French, uh, the cock uh, does a cocorico, but uh, in English, cock -do -do. it does da 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 too. <laughs> when I was young, I can't imagine that a, that a, a, that a rooster can do cock a do do <laughs> Impossible for me to do that. So we, are, we ask children to, to indicate a different language they know, and we create. Uh, the flower of the language of the classroom, which is a way to uh, recognize the diversity in the different classroom. In this kind of activities, they have to guess the title of the little red, red riding hood in uh, ten different languages. Not all sorts of different activities in the kind of um, language awareness. <laughs> the presence of bilingual book and the presence of books that evokes other languages. So very quickly, in the classroom, you can have so many wonderful books who can help the children to talk about their experience, about their different language. This is my, my favorite, but I'm not allowed uh, to talk. No, not allowed. It's, it's a very nice one. Very, if you have questions about uh, if you have questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I'm actually the token anglophone in our group. <laughs> It's so nice to see so many people here tonight, especially for an evening session, and lovely to be back in Toronto. I did my doctorate at York, and I've been on faculty at McGill for, this is now my eighth year. I'm going to tell you about a project um, that I'm calling We Are Here, New Sons You See, because that's the name of the curriculum guides that we developed, but in fact, the project itself is the life stories of Montrealers displaced by war, genocide, and other human rights violations. So it's a big, meaty title and very descriptive. Uh, I've been involved with it since 2007. I've been co-chairing co one of the working groups, the education working group. The project was um, spearheaded by uh, someone with remarkable talents in community organizing and collaborative research. His name is Stephen High. He's an oral historian who started the Center for uh, Oral and Digital History at Concordia, some people know it. And it's the, uh, it was funded by Acura, which are, have a new incarnation, but the Community University Research Alliances. And it involved a team of you know, more than 50 researchers, multiple communities, and in which the community partners were also equal partners in the research. And it was a project, and I can, I can say this because I was only one of many that actually really walked the talk around participatory research and the decision making was all collaborative which was crazy making but you know incredibly successful at the same time. Um, I co-chaired only one of the working groups you can see here that um, there's a Cambodian working group, uh, a Rwandan working group, a Haiti working group, a Holocaust and other persecutions against Jews working group and then I, the, the education group was one of the three dissemination groups because the project's main commitment was to generate 500 life story interviews with from members of these various uh, communities, so Rwandan, Haitian, um, Holocaust survivor, and Cambodian, um, but then to disseminate them as widely as possible through oral history and performance, through uh, radio programming, um, and then in education. And so I co-chaired the education and working group with Emmanuel Sontag, who at that time was the education coordinator for the Montreal Holocaust Memorial Center. And um, we, we, we did all sorts of things, uh, which culminated in the production of some curriculum guides, which I'll tell you about at the end. But before I do that, I want to describe a little bit the context of this project. Uh, just as the project was beginning, um, our former premier, Jean Charest, struck what's now known as the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. Mm -hmm. Is this something, is everyone familiar with it? Yeah. Is there anyone who's not familiar with it? Okay, I'll, I'll say briefly, the Bouchard-Taylor Commission was struck in response to what was perceived as a moment of crisis in Quebec. And uh, our colleague, Marie Spotvin, has done a brilliant report where she looks at the ways in which the media actually were very complicit in fostering a sense of crisis. And the worries were that central tenets of Quebec identity were under attack from immigrants from racialized minorities, particularly religious minorities, and so that things like that, the value of secularity, equality between men and women were, were coming into her attack. And there, there was a series of incidents that led up to the um, commission, the, the kind of catalyst probably being the, the Boucherville incident, this tiny town in which there's almost zero cultural diversity. In fact, there might have been zero cultural yeah, diversity. Bouchard-Taylor, yeah. uh, set up, um, published a, a report for newcomers that people had to read, which set up the sort of central tenets of what it would mean to live in Eroville, and included things like we don't allow wife burning here. You know, so <laughs> this was the kind of level of the debate. It was actually quite deeply embarrassing for, I think, most Quebecois. And so the, and the commission immediately fell under critique. Um, and there's a great report by a group called Accommodate This, which took issue with many of the foundations of the commission, which suggested somehow that the immigrant, the racialized minority, needed to somehow be accommodated. 
despite the and then and unfortunately it was a consisted of a series of research reports but also a series of public forums um, and and people could submit uh, a series of public hearings and unfortunately it also it kind of uh, opened the airways to a lot of really bigoted statements although not as many as got reported in the media that said I think the report is actually quite useful and one of the things they do is shed light on problems of poverty as real barriers to integration rather than religious difference for instance but I give you all of this context because one of their recommendations was that Quebec set up a large oral history project um, to enrich people's sense of, of uh, cultural history and memory of the idea of who could be Quebecois. And so this project immediately sent out a press release saying, well, we're actually doing this. Um, and so the, so I say all this to, oh, here's um, another, we, we have two websites, the main one that you saw, the first one, and this is the website that includes all the, uh, the video interviews and including digital story versions, so short versions of the oral history interviews, which can be 20 hours long you know anything about life story interviewing they're non-directed interviews they often take place over several days and so they can be a bit unwieldy for for instance classroom use and so the project also set about creating digital story <coughs> versions of the oral histories where interviewees would work with editors and create three to five seven minute versions um, so this is what the website looks like which houses all of the video transcripts or the video testimonies so the education working group, so I've given you a sense, a bit of the larger project, the context. So these are some of the activities that uh, we were committed to. Um, some pe members of the group worked with Holocaust educators who had been testifying for many years but had never really reflected on that experience of, being, uh, of doing education through their own testimony. So there's some publications on that. Um, there were interviews done with human rights activists, and some of the, these are on the website. We worked with two teachers, in fact, who both approached us, who created, in fact, both of them award-winning documentaries with their students. Um, the one I know, the project I know best is Life in the Open Prison, because I work with Megan Webster, and her students interviewed Cambodian genocide survivors and created a superb documentary that's also available on the website. Um, but and the part that I was involved in was the development of pedagogical tools, including what in Quebec are called learning and evaluation situations. They're kind of really big, meaty curricular units. Um, and we created them in French and English. So it's uh, in English, it's called We're Here at French New Sons C. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, our objectives in creating those units, here, here are three of the ways we were thinking about it. The first was to support an anti-racist and critical multicultural project uh, to, and fostering a richer and more inclusive collective cultural memory. So get, really working to disseminate these stories so that we can challenge the kind of discourses of othering involved in the you know, new evu that we kept seeing over and over in the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. Um, and also encourage self-reflection among students on questions of cultural identity and power relations. So we, we wanted there to be a critical aspect to the, the kind of work these documents were doing. Uh, we were interested in giving students a greater sense of awareness of human rights education, human rights violations. And then also, finally, promoting the pedago uh, pedagogic possibilities of oral history in Quebec classrooms. Okay, so this is what our guideline, our document, the cover looks like. Here it is in French. Because of the content, uh, we designed the materials for uh, um, the last three years of high school. Okay, and so this is the table of contents. I know I realize it's tiny, but we give a kind of toolkit where we introduce teachers to the subject of human rights violations and then also to life stories and oral history. And then we tie these themes and then the units very carefully to uh, competencies in the Quebec curriculum because we know that no matter how interesting teachers will think a curriculum guide is if they don't feel like they can use it easily they won't they won't <coughs> um, and so here are the different learning and evaluation situations uh, designed across for use across the curriculum so English language arts history and citizenship ethics and religious culture which is we could spend a lot more than 15 minutes talking to you about this quite unique program in the Quebec curriculum 
contemporary world, which is high school social studies. Um, and okay. so that's what all of those look like now. Okay, great. And so, so these are all designed for students who are generally 14 to 16 years old. They're connected to particular subjects, deal with particular competencies. And now all of the, all of the various LESs ask students to engage with quite difficult material. And so our challenge was in thinking on how best to equip students to do that. Um, and now Emmanuel and I are writing about this experience of producing these guides. And we've realized, I mean, I, it was, I think Emmanuel had a clearer sense of this all along, that what all of the units do is really foreground listening as a skill. And because part of what we worry is that schools are very noisy places, um, that students are moving from subject to subject, but also that it might be that we're no longer very good at listening, particularly when the material is challenging, mm -hmm. uh, challenging on many levels, challenging our sense of human equity and fairness and goodness, challenging our sense of our own identities. I mean, that that when you're, we've, and we've tried to pick uh, digital stories which aren't the most upsetting ones, but we, you know, there are testimonies from survivors, for instance, of the Rwandan genocide. So it's pretty tough material. And so how to prepare students to do it? Well, uh, and, and, what, and when we think about I mean, it raises a, a number of questions for us. What, in a, what is pedagogical listening? What kind of listening do students need to be able to do in order to engage thoughtfully with these materials? But also, when we, when we ask students to listen to traumatic material, what are we hoping that they're going to learn? Um, what might constitute an ethics of engagement with these difficult stories? And so one of the things that we're looking at is some of the trauma and witnessing literature around ethics of engagement because as soon as you listen to one of these stories you're put in the position of having some responsibility to then continue disseminating that story yourself and this is where the pedagogy the witnessing literature is useful but also one of the problems with the testimony and witness literature is that it puts the recipient in somewhat of a passive position you know you you try to erase your subjectivity as much as possible so that you can you know, honor and res the, the story of the teller. But we don't think, we want our students to then become part of what Roger Simon has called the chain of testimony and continue to share those stories. And so that means putting them in, the, in a more active listening position. Um, and so I'll just give you a little description of how we've prioritized listening in our materials. Um, so in one of our units, students create a digital story version of a 30-minute clip, interview clip taken from one of the life story interviews. So they listen carefully to the interview, mapping out key information, but also thinking narratively in terms of structure, themes, and other story elements. And then they work in groups to uh, take edit down that 30-minute interview into a digital story. So they're doing, they're creating digital stories in the way that many of the interviewees have done. Um, through the process, the students are act, asked to act as witness to the singularity of another's tale, but then also to grapple with questions about shared significance, to become part of that chain of witnessing, um, and testifying themselves about the dizzying blends of the worst and sometimes best aspects of human nature which can characterize survivor stories. In another unit, students participate in a series of listening activities that support them in listening carefully to an audio guide commemorating the Rwandan genocide that was created by Steve High and Lisa Najera, one of the uh, directors of the Rwandan Working Group. Um, so they listen to this audio guide that takes them through the streets of Montreal, and then reflecting on the experience of being both a listener and a witness, they then create the audio guides that, uh, that, that their own audio guides and map themselves onto the city, locating themselves as storied and interpretive beings in Montreal and in relation to the stories of others. And then similarly, in a third unit, the students listen to a series of digital stories and then experiment with different ways of visually mapping keywords and phrases onto a representation of Montreal, creating an alternative cartography of the city composed of the stories of its immigrants and refugees, 
And then they then map their own experiences on the map. So it's them sort of putting themselves into relation. And I know that one of the problems with, with that is to then minimize the uniqueness or the singularity of other stories. But we think that it's important that the students build a relation between what they're learning um, you know, and the experiences of the people in the community around them in their own lives. So we intend these materials to help students and teachers gain greater understanding of concepts and experiences of human rights violations, what it might mean to have witnessed a genocide, to be displaced by war, or to have arrived somewhere new as a refugee or immigrant. And as we disseminate these life stories, we also envision students learning something about the nature of story making and telling in their own lives as well as in the lives of others in the interest of helping people rethink what is known of, of home and to create new narratives of what it might mean to be Quebecois in changing times. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, so now we've got, because they were so disciplined. Um, we have terrorized. <laughs> Uh, we've got about 20 minutes um, for uh, conversation and questions and answers. And what I'm going to suggest for sort of ground rules is if you want to uh, make your questions speak clearly, introduce yourself. And what I think we'll do is collect three or four at a time and then have the panelists respond and then collect another three or four at a time and do it that way. That way then there can be, there's the potential for a little bit more mixing and give and take rather than going one by one by one because then we'll We'll get three questions, all four of them will respond, and that'll be it. So that, that wouldn't work as well. Now I'll be quiet. Okay, who wants to go first? Ready. Hi, my question is for, What's your name, what's your name, what's your name? Um, my name is Anne, and I'm actually um, uh, representing the Inclusive Education Branch on the Ministry. And um, I'm very interested in some of the uh, Beautiful resources that I've heard about tonight, but for you, I'm sorry, well, Bronwyn. Bronwyn, would you suggest that the use of some of the materials that are, especially the videos, like are they for public use yes. on your website? Yes. Do you think that they would require some special training on the part of teachers in order before they're using them? Well, the, our, our, I mean, it's a very good question. The, the guide tries to do that in by giving people foundations in human rights. Um, discourses and thinking about oral history. One of the things that's come up when we've discussed these uh, in Montreal at the Sitom is that people have been really worried about the consequence of not being able to plan for the consequences of viewing some of these stories in classrooms mm -hmm. where students might uh, themselves have experienced traumas of all kinds, whether you know geopolitical ones or more, uh, more micro ones in families and um, don't really have the thing about creating curriculum guides, it's my first time doing it, you then send them out into the world and you hope that people use them will, you know, will have, be able to find supports in order to work with them well. But th that said, many of the, of the resources are not all that challenging. You know, a number of them are from the perspectives of young people who are maybe, uh, their refugee experiences that they're, the children or grandchildren of refugees. And so they're telling stories about which are, I think, would be much easier to integrate into a, into any school context. More questions? What? Here, have your question and then go ahead. Uh, I'm Salim, uh, a doctoral student here. Um, well, from what I listen to the panel is there is an element of identity formation uh, as, as a Quebecois. Quebecois. Um, to what extent does it contribute to the debate of uh, Quebec being separate from the rest of Canada as a separate nationality? Or to what extent does it contribute to, the, to Canadianism as a whole? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we'd get a couple more questions. <laughs> okay, so my question is about film and its use in representing different groups of people and the history of film in projecting identities on those groups or potentially stereotyping the experiences of groups. Um, and I'm just wondering how that's being impacted for in the development of the curriculum. Okay, so we've got a question about identity formation film and maybe we'll have it one more, go ahead. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation by the school board, very passionate uh, presentation. 
based on my personal experience, segregating students, uh, immigrant students for about a couple of years, if I got it right, um, in the school system can actually create a social stigma within the school system for the students as well as the teachers, because even the teachers in the system would um, uh, avoid going into classes where it's the immigrant children as compared to the mainstream. Now, how do you manage uh, handling that uh, segregation within the school system because of this thing? Okay. So that, that's similarity between those two last questions, the stigma of targeted program, so targeted approaches. Okay. Okay, so I, you're the expert. It's not going to be facile. It's not going to be easy as well about the segregation in class that goes. Then we'll go to stereotyping and understand. First of all, the, the, the children are going to stay one year, maybe two years, but uh, it's more rare. Uh, and you, you ask a re very real question. Maybe they need a su support in language, but at the same time, they're not integrating in the real life exactly. with the, the regular. So you can have this kind of model of a class fermé. Close classroom. Close classroom. But at the same time, in different schools, you have some kind of uh, partial integration. So they, are, they receive uh, language courses, but at the same time, they are going to share uh, educational, physical, educational, or other kind of disciplines with their, uh, with their camp pairs of the same age. But it's, it's a real problem and to find, again, mm -hmm. f finding balance between giving them the, the support in language and at the same time really have uh, put the emphasis on the, on the necessity of integration. Yeah, because it is a potential danger of them being in pockets of immigrant children. You're right. Even when they and, uh, in, two, in two minutes, you know, when a kid arrives in the kindergarten, they are, they are, uh, there's, no, there's no classroom. There's a few, but we have tendency. When you arrive in grade five, six, or secondary, it's another story. And of course, it's not the fact that we want to segregate, make a segregation, but the, 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 the objective of that classroom is to reduce the gap. Okay. And I will say that uh, we are working on that because I always give as an example, it's only on the island of Montreal that we have the, that model, because it's a model, you know, a closed class. Because if you go to another area, there's less, and students are already in the regular classroom. And I, I think it's an important issue, but uh, there is a lot of projects that we are doing among those two classes. For example, we receive a, a money from the government to make projects within the class, and also there's integration. So it's not as segregated as you think, because most of the classroom are close to the other uh, the school that you are, you will go. Can I, I say something on that one? When you look at the quantitative data, outlying regions have the worst outcomes, in part because they have this type of very sketchy uh, FSL, like you were yourself. And students are emerged in the regular classroom and they receive maybe five or six hours a week of, uh, of less, less, less than that linguistic support. And I remember not so long ago, I had a MA student who made a comparison between the way uh, people were criticizing their model in Toronto as opposed to the way in Montreal. In Montreal, people complain that it's segregative, but in Toronto, people complain that ESL is not sufficient and that is sketchy and that kids enter in the regular classroom and they don't, that there's no system of systematic suivi. So it's, again, it's, your, it's, it's a phenomenal, you know? Like, I think specific model has pervert effect, specific class, but only ESL and being immersed in regular classroom also have their pervert effect. So it's a, a, f a fine line. No. It's a fine line between both. And it depends on the age of the students. It depends uh, of the uh, how much the student has a cultural capital in the family or, or as, is more challenged. So I think it's a balance. It's well, a last, year, balance. last year I came to uh, Ontario and I bring back from Ontario a very nice tool that gave us exactly to take a good picture of the kids of the oral writing and speaking and to to try to, uh, as the uh, insertion in the regular classroom, as soon as possible. And we have a, we have a very good uh, tool in the Ontario that we bring into uh, my school board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we had the, also the question about film the and representation and identity. Okay. Um, I think I need a clarification. So 
are your concerns that film leads itself more readily to stereotypical representations than other kinds of texts? Well, yeah, just in, in I like the idea that it, it's introducing a different media to the students and that they get to engage with more technology in that respect. At the same time, I'm wondering how um, it lends itself to the opportunity for, for students to be projecting identities or understanding based on what they're learning with different um, immigrant communities and their experiences um, to make generalizations of that. Well, one thing about a project this large is that there's not one testimony from the Cambodian that uh, then st is made to stand for the rep the experiences of all Cambodians. There are, you know, hundreds of, of of video testimonies from that group, and so I think that that might help mitigate mitigate against uh, some of what you're describing. But I think you know there's always the challenge, especially in the project where people are actually editing themselves, that um, editing other people's words, that you know that things need to be done in thoughtful mm -hmm. and sensitive ways. Absolutely, but I'm not sure that's something that a curriculum can actually uh, fight against mm -hmm. necessarily. I think it's a pedagogy question. But why would there be any different than text in terms of the I'm not sure. The one billion question. Okay, ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the question? The question was that all, all this type of uh, intercultural activities and what we're describing is it aiming at? Uh, is it actually creating a new Quebec identity? And if so, is it a new Quebec identity that that reinforces the the sense of distinctiveness from Canada, or is it something that brings us? closer to Canada. I'm going to jump and then <laughs> I'm not pretending that my answer would be the right one. Uh, I'd say one thing which is rather clear, which has made Quebec rather distinct those last, since 1990, since the mcdougal gagnon Tremblay Accord, the Canada-Quebec Accord, is that Quebec is selecting its own immigrant. So it does mean that the composition of immigration is very different in Quebec. So in the past, for example, you had a huge Italian community in, Quebec, in Montreal and in Toronto. You had, communities were the same. Now the communities are very different. And the community who, who concentrate in Quebec, you don't, they, you don't find them very much in Toronto and Ontario and vice versa. Except for a few exceptions, Chinese are in both cities. But overall, the, the North African uh, and the Haitian are the, the, the image of otherness in Quebec. While in in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Ontario, I guess it would be mostly the Black Caribbean and maybe some new community. In in uh, it's true also in the in BC, although they don't select their immigrants, they have different communities. So the composition is different. Uh, most of those immigrants uh, come from francophone countries. Sixty-five percent of uh, of uh, I, I cannot. I always forget this term. The requérant principal, the principal applicant, new French when they enter the province of Quebec, and except <coughs> for security and health uh, st streaming, they, did, they didn't see any federal officer uh, when they were selected. So it, it certainly creates something different uh, in the area of immigration. Now, does it mean that? Uh, does it mean that those immigrants feel Quebecois uh, more than Canadian? I don't know. Probably it would have worked if Quebecois uh, integration policy was totally inclusive, but there's been so many, uh, it has a back fired. It used to be much more inclusive in the 80s, 90s, and then with the coming of age, when it actually started to work and immigrants were actually integrating the French milieu, then you saw the coming of all the debate about otherness and cultural differences. Before you didn't have that. You have, they don't want to be, to be part of us. They want to learn English, but we would be so open if they joined us. But when they did join us, then all of a sudden the discussion about cultural differences and religion and the importance of religion, for example, is is linked to the difference of composition. Don't forget, 40% of migrants in the last 10 years in Quebec come from North Africa. So it's something. So and so it's uh, the, the importance of religious debate is because of the composition of immigrants, so it's very visible. So does it make Quebec more in, more different than Canada? In a way, yes, uh, Quebec is, uh, because of his immigration policy is different, not only for a lot of reasons, it's also different in, in the type of immigrant, his immigration policy. But in another way, I'd say the challenge we're facing uh, are very similar to the challenge you would face in many uh, uh, the, the, main, the main cities. 
The language question is a little bit more tricky, but for the rest, uh, uh, inequality, uh, intercultural relation. So in, it brings us closer to any big city in the world, but not necessarily closer to Toronto. Problem of, of, of uh, globalization is that it, did, it does sometimes enhance uh, regional identity because it makes country irrelevant. So in a way, yes, we're close to Toronto, but we're close to New York too, we're close to Barcelona. So, because globalization, globalization has this effect, you know, uh, that uh, the world becomes the same, so in a way, the, the nation withers its, its power, and nation, uh, Canadian identity was never very strong in Quebec, so it's not going to get stronger in the context of globalization. And the composition of immigration, and the fact that for 20, 25 years we have a different immigration, more francophone, uh, it certainly creates a difference, uh, it, it, it's an, another layer of identity. Of, of culture in Quebec, which is slightly different. But racism and the prejudice and the inequality is um, you know, the same. We share that with the rest of Canada, I guess. Goes across. Yes, right. goes across the country and. Mm -hmm. No, I will say other question. Can, can talk that for okay. a right. No, it's difficult, honestly. I don't know if I answer. No, I mean, I, I'm just going to pick up on one thread to clarify. You, you, you draw our attention to religious difference from North Africa. Do you feel like there is actually a separate conversation about religious distinction, or is the religious conversation a proxy for a race conversation? Uh, I wouldn't say no. It's not a proxy at all for a race conversation. So really, there is a separate there is a separate concern about religion that uh, has nothing to do with race. I, I wouldn't say nothing. You know, no, no, nothing is never nothing. But uh, <laughs> 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 we're in academia. We're not to see that nothing to do. With it. This is not a politician. We're in academia. <laughs> but no, we're in academia. Now, what I would say is that uh, the. the one proof of that is that you can you can quote you know uh, you know story like Aeroville, but actually when you look at the conversation uh, among the stronger spokespersons, uh, worry about the too much accommodation of religious diversity are Muslim uh, women and Muslim minority themselves. So you can really see that the, the debate on, on religion in Quebec, before it got hijacked by media and it became an identity stuff, it started in the 90s, and it was always the immigrants from North Africa who say, we came here, it was not to, re to live what we live in under the fast in, in Algeria. Uh, a lot, and when I say different picture, another interesting thing, because we select all those immigrants from former French colony, I don't know how the French did, but they mistreated their colony awfully, mm -hmm. but they were extremely good at instillating uh, uncritical admiration for the French model. And it's incredible, uh, and you, feel, you see that in, uh, everybody coming from a former French colony mm -hmm. has a very strong commitment to the idea that French republicanism is a good thing, uh, it's citizenship, and the, it, it doesn't divide people, it's not like multiculturalism. So actually, you find among uh, supporters of this, uh, uh, this worry about religious diversity taking too much room, and a very striving for this citizenship common bond a lot of immigrants, and this is linked to the selection of immigrants we have also. So I would say certainly there is some Islamophobia, which is different for race for me, from international context in, from the 911. But the <laughs> debate started before 911, it actually started in the 90s, and it started basically with the coming of Algerian refugees from, uh, from North Africa in the mid 90s. So it's a complex Great. debate. Great, interesting. Get your hand up. Okay, um, I'm African. I'm from Ghana. Mm -hmm. We don't speak French in Ghana. I know. We speak only English. And so you, hate, you hate the British? I don't know why. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> you should tell the, the other African they should hate the French as much as you hate the English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they love so much friends when friends okay, so them so much. Yeah, I'm trying to do my M.E. Master of Education okay. here at U of T. So you guys are graduating next year, and I'm looking for a job in Montreal. And I don't speak French. Will you sign me to be a teacher in Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> There is an English school. There is an English school. There is an English school. English school. I can't answer that because there's two English school boards on the island of Montreal. English school boards. Just two. 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 Actually, I, I can speak to this question because I work at McGill and we prepare teachers for those English school boards. And uh, 
I I wouldn't be very. I mean, I would have to. You'd have to think carefully about it because you know that. So here's the dilemma that we have the English schools. First of all, their populations are shrinking, and so every year there are school closures. So at McGill, we're preparing teachers for fewer and fewer schools. The second component is that parents now realize that if they want their children to stay and work in Quebec, they need to have a higher level of French proficiency than they're getting in the French in the English school system. Mm -hmm. And so most schools are now bilingual or French immersion, which means that the, at the primary only, level. at the primary level, but it wow. means that the only openings, high school as well, the only openings for new teachers are in uh, positions where you're expected to teach in French. So no is the answer. <laughs> I want to send the question back. I want to send this question back to the audience. If I, if I didn't speak a word of, of French, of English, uh, even if the, I was offered a job in the Francophone School Board in Toronto, would you advise me to settle in Toronto and not knowing a word of English? The answer is no. Eh? <laughs> I mean, I, would, I, I could not survive. I, if I can compare, you would survive better in Montreal being unilingual English than I would survive in Toronto being unilingual French. That, that's true. I mean, actually, this is the bottom line. And this, this is the bottom line. But when, when, the only, when the only jobs that actually get hired now, they're looking for friends. That's I know, but if I don't speak no, English, I, agree, I, agree. I cannot even buy a talk at the, at the, at the, at the store. <laughs> well, you can, you can go anywhere in Montreal and they'll, they'll sell you things and well, you know okay. what? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, we are at our, our time. Thank you everyone for coming. Let's give a round of applause to our panel.